God. If you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23. We're going to dive into our exposition of Scripture this morning, which is not only our custom here, it is our privilege, and we thank the Lord for His Word and His graciousness toward us in speaking to us by the Holy Spirit through Scripture. We're working in our series of Luke now, and it has been about, well, close to three years, and we're up to chapter 23, which in fact is extremely close to the end, which means we are very nigh unto that moment when Jesus Christ is pinned to a Roman cross, dying for the sins of his people. When we open up chapter 23, what we find is we are still moving through the events of Jesus' extremely corrupt and illegal trial, his immoral uh, against all jurisprudence experience before Pilate, Herod, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, as he's dragged to and fro before all these authorities, and each one will attempt to decide whether he is guilty or innocent and what kind of punishment he ought to deserve if found guilty. So we open up chapter 23, and what's happened here is overnight Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane the night before. He's dragged before the high priest and there's, we explained last week, there's kind of two high priests at this point. There's not really one. There's Annas and Caiaphas and one of them's the legitimate high priest that the Jews have elected and the other one, a relative, is kind of put in place by the Romans as kind of like a figurehead high priest because they didn't like the other guy. So the Jews have got two high priests at this point and Jesus He's dragged before both, and both of them despise him, they hate him, they want to get rid of him, and are finding ways that they can have him killed. And so he's brought before the Sanhedrin, and the charge against him is blasphemy. He, he blasphemes God, so he has to die. But there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this because the Jews, since coming under Roman power, don't have the authority to execute capital punishment. They can't do it. So whenever they find someone guilty uh, of a crime worthy of death, they have to take them before the Roman rulers and plead with the Roman rulers to find the individual guilty and worth killing. And sometimes that was difficult to do because Jewish law and Roman law were drastically different. So here's Jesus before the Sanhedrin. They charge him with blasphemy, but that's not a compelling case. If you go before Rome and say, we found this guy guilty of blasphemy, let's have him killed. Rome's going to say, we don't care about your religious ceremonial laws. So we open up chapter 23 of Luke and we find that the Sanhedrin and the priests, the chief priests and the Pharisees and so on and so forth, that they've dragged Jesus before Pontius Pilate and they're going to, they're going to distort the charges against him and try and make it sound like Jesus has been, has been anti-authoritarian and has been trying to undermine the authority of the empire. Let's take a look at our text this morning. I'm going to read verse 1 to verse 25. Verse 1 says, Then the whole company, that refers to the Sanhedrin, arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. And Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt with this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long to desire, he had long desired to see him, because he'd heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at length, but Jesus made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been an enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us 
Barabbas. That is a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. May the Lord bless the reading of his own precious word. What a moment. What an account in the life of Jesus Christ. We've been tracing this story for three years now, moving through the gospel of Luke. And we have seen Jesus Christ every bit God as he claims to be. We have seen him every bit human as he obviously is now standing. Now we see him standing before the petty kings of this world to be tossed around, punished, whipped, mocked, beaten, and judged as to whether he is guilty of any major crime. You can't come before the Roman rulers and say, we're concerned this guy's committed blasphemy because Rome will not will not punish anyone on those grounds. So you saw the Sanhedrin and the chief priests modify the charges. Insurrection. He teaches the people to, to despise Rome and to stand up against the tyranny of Rome, which we know is not true. We've walked through Jesus' teaching. If anything, he's not sympathetic to Rome. He's not antagonistic to Rome. If anything, he said, let the powers be as they are. You come follow me. And then the next charge was he refuses and he, he, he claims that people ought not to pay tax to Caesar. Only a couple of chapters ago, we saw that this is, this is clearly and demonstrably not true. As he was approached in the very temple, and the first time these guys came to him, they said to him, do you think it's lawful to pay, to pay tax to Caesar or not? trying to trick him because if he said that paying tax to Caesar was lawful, they would call him anti-Jewish and anti-God. And Jesus answered, you remember, render to Caesar what's Caesar and render to God what is God's. And so every single charge that they bring against Jesus Christ is clearly and demonstrably not true. And then the last charge, he claims he is the Christ and they translate it for Pilate. The Christ. The Christ. It's, a, it's a religious title. He claims he is the Christ, a king. And then Pilate says, are you a king? And Jesus responds with this, this classic kind of, kind of passive affirmation. He says, you have said so. He is a king. But not in the sense that Pilate would presume he was a king. He was not only the king of the Jews and the king of Rome and the king of Asia Minor and the king of Europe. He was the king of the universe. But that's not the sense that Pilate understood the word. And so Jesus makes sure to answer in a very strange, passive manner. Here we have Jesus now standing before the petty kings of the world to be judged. And we go now to Philippians 2. Turn in your Bible to Philippians 2. What we're going to see in Philippians 2 is Paul begins to, Paul begins to speak and, and reference what's called the Carmen Christi, the, the hymn to Christ. We're going to see in Paul's very, uh, very sharp and short summary the subsequent steps of condescension of Jesus Christ our Lord who being made one with us, came and died to redeem us. Paul lists this for us in Philippians 2, and Paul's motive here in Philippians 2 is to encourage the Christians to humility. We go to our Bibles to Philippians 2, we're going to see precisely how Paul details this. Started reading at verse 6. Philippians 2, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Take a look more carefully here at this passage and note the successive steps of the plummet. The plummet, the, the drop, the, the frightening, stomach-turning drop that Jesus experienced through every successive step of humiliation. Paul starts out. Paul starts out by saying, He who was in the form of God, the very nature of God. Jesus Christ, fully God, in the eternal celestial throne of heaven, He is God. And then Paul says, subsequently, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Though He is in nature and in essence God, He relinquished the claim on the divinity. And then it says, it says He made Himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant and being found in human form. Look at the successive steps. Form of God. Did not consider equality with God a, a thing to be grasped, but made Himself nothing. Being found in human form, He made Himself a servant. Each particular point of the condescension of Jesus Christ is beyond fathoming for you and I as to the amount of humility and patronage that this would cost Him to drop each point. And now we arrive at that moment where having Jesus, our Lord, our God, found in human form, found in the appearance of man, humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Here is God incarnate, Jesus Christ. Here is God incarnate, Jesus Christ, who, whose consciousness has been, has been soaked in the worship of blindingly white angels and pure and holy and majestic beings in heaven for successive eons. He now stands before the petty kings of the world to be judged. What do you think this is like for him? To come and stand before a Pontius Pilate. Some, some, some sub-ruler who's, who's cast out of the backwater of the empire, Pontius Pilate. And then to go from Pontius Pilate to stand before Herod. To stand before Herod. Jesus, God incarnate, has to stand before Herod and not only be judged by him, but then mocked and ridiculed and tormented by his soldiers and himself. Rightly does do the prophets of old say, and like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. You remember what we, we looked at last week in the Garden of Gethsemane? If this Jesus wanted to, by his own, by his own statement, he could release 12 legions of angels at his beck and call, but thankfully to Herod and Pilate, he opened not his mouth. It would be unfathomable to imagine exactly what 72,000 angels could do with the Roman Empire if Jesus, their commander and their sovereign, said, lay waste to this thing now. But he opened not his mouth. He stands humble, broken, beaten, tormented before Pilate, who finds him innocent. And four times he tells the accusers this. Three times explicitly, Pilate says, I find no guilt in this man. And the fourth time he says, this is why Herod returned him to me. There is nothing in him worthy of death. But the crowds stirred up by the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the chief priests, the, the crowds were baying for his blood and cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, release to us Barabbas, but kill this Messiah. What a moment, what a moment in the life of Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, made himself nothing, emptied himself, took on the form of a servant and being found in human form, he humbled himself. I suspect there has possibly never been a greater contrast to the pre-existent throne of Christ to now as he stands before the petty kings who stand over him, imagining that they rule him and that they own him, will pass judgment upon him. Of course, Paul doesn't stop there in Philippians 2. He drops even lower. It says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself 
became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This infinite God, the Lord of life, the most greatest holiness, majesty, sovereignty that could, would ever exist, dropped each successive step. And the Bible tells us He did this for sinners like you and I. For you and I. Because that's how, that's how low we are. That's how weak and impotent we are. That's how rebellious we are. The Bible is clear that we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. But God sent forth His Son, Jesus Christ, to live sin-free on our behalf and die for our crimes if we trust in Him. There's an incredible story. I, I thought I'd share this with you this morning. There's a, it comes from this book here called The Unlisted Legion, written by Jock Purves. And I recommend this too if you're interested in reading that is a great resource. Jock Purves is a great author, and he had some great experiences, was a missionary, in fact. And he wrote a great book called Fair Sunshine, which is a, a narrative of the covenanters in Scotland who refused to acknowledge any ruler over them but Christ and the crown of Jesus Christ. You can go read that story of the covenanters, the martyrs of the Scottish church, siding with Christ and being hunted down and killed for their faith only a few hundred years ago. But Jock Purves was, in fact, as I said, he was also a missionary. 1925, he went to Kashmir and Tibet as a pioneer missionary with a worldwide evangelization crusade. If you've heard that name before, it might be because it was founded by C.T. Studd, who we speak of here semi-regularly. Jock Purves describes his colorful, dramatic experience in Lesser Tibet and the Indian Afghan frontier, living alone in primitive village, 11,000 feet of altitude, cut off from the rest of the world. For eight months of the year, snow would bear down. It would be almost impossible to live. He shares how when he arrives in these extremely primitive people groups in the, in, in, in the early part of last century, he goes to minister among them, and, and the vast majority of these people are, are incredibly primitive, as I said, but they've also been contaminated with the religion of Islam. And Jock Purves would say, as being a, being a European missionary, finally arriving in these extremely remote parts of the Himalayan mountains where no traveler or, 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 or Westerner had ever been before, they were shocked. They were shocked at the amount of disgust the people had toward the name of Jesus Christ. Jock Purves relates in his story that when they arrived in these incredibly, incredibly primitive people groups, as soon as you would mention the name Jesus, people couldn't hold back their disgust and they would almost instantaneous, without even thinking about it, they would spit on the ground. Just mention Jesus, everyone in, within earshot would spit on the ground. Furious and angry, and Jock Purves shares how missionary work seemed almost impossible to bore through the, the stone and the rock of unbelief and offense at the name of Jesus Christ. He shares in his, in his story of the missionary journey that it was in, incredible to learn that one of, the, one of the earliest and most obvious things that would open up the gospel for these people wasn't education, it wasn't literature, it was none of those things, but it was in fact medical treatment. Now he, stare, he shares in the book that neither him nor any of his companions had any medical training at all. But simply growing up in the West and having a basic understanding of, I don't know, hygiene and first aid, they were able to, in fact, preserve many lives. He tells the story how often quite a significant portion of his day as being a missionary would be to travel from one tiny little, little canvas leather tent to another one, simply seeing to the sick. And they wouldn't go to the missionary unless someone was on their deathbed. They refused to speak to the Jesus lovers unless someone was, it was, was confirmed to die. He tells this one story. He goes inside this tent so shallow, so low, so, so incompetent to keep out the cold and the wind. And he cl crawls into the tent where there's no light and no ventilation. And in the corner of this tent where these people are living is this boy, this teenage boy lying on the ground. And his leg was so gangrenous 
He said it was clear he had almost no time left to live. And the people had finally called him in as the missionary, come on in and, 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 and see to this guy. And, and every time he would be there trying to, trying to help, and he's not, a, he's not a medical professional, he's not a surgeon, he hasn't had any training, he just tries to do what he can do. He takes out a scalpel. He begins trying to mend the leg, trying to cut off the, the gangrenous and, and the toxic flesh as best as he could without any, without any surgery experience or training at all. He does, he does his best. It tells the story how he's sitting there squatting in the squalor of this tent and the vermin who could not be seen, he said, were rancid and everywhere. He said he'd be squatting in this, in this tent with this boy, this teenage boy, and the smell was beyond describing, he says. No ventilation. The tent was full of the smoke of the tiny primitive fire in the center of the tent. And here he is off in the corner with the stink of rotting flesh and the smoke from the fire combining to make an experience that could not be described. And he's sitting there with barely any light, barely any experience, no training at all, with a little scalpel trying to heal this boy. And what does he do while he's there? He thinks, here's an opportunity. So he starts to share the gospel with this boy. What does the boy do? The same thing they all do. He starts to get angry and furious. He starts spitting and swearing and cussing and fighting and arguing. And other people in the tent hear the stir and they come on over to join the debate and start shouting and crying and screaming and cursing this missionary who is simply doing his best to heal the boy. He says it was so bad. It was so bad it would take him four hours a day to work on this leg. A leg with a boy who apparently had no signs of ever recovering but he would do what he could for four hours a day he said every time he came out of that tent the vermin were crawling over him in such an incredibly over-encompassing manner he writes in the book you could put your hand down your shirt and pull it out you couldn't even see skin and he goes into this tent every day for four hours to squat over gangrenous flesh to do what he can do. And the boy that he's working on refuses to even hear the name of Jesus Christ. I was, I was reading this and I just, I just kept thinking to myself, that is, no, that is nothing compared to Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate and Herod. It's nothing compared. We, we think of this missionary and, and, and the boy, he recovers, miraculously he recovers. We think of this missionary and the cost of being so humiliated, coming from a high and lofty society in Scotland, well educated, great prospects of a great life. And here he is spending his adulthood, the years of his prime, hoveled in a tent, kneeling over gangrenous flesh, being cursed and spat upon, crawling over by vermin and wishing nothing but to get out of there. And yet he can't. And it is nothing compared to the condescension of Jesus Christ for you and I. That seems pretty intense. That seems pretty incredible. It seems like, like Jock Purves and his missionary team had, had such an incredible plummet of humiliation. But you need to read Luke 23 as knowing that Jesus Christ from the celestial realm of glory to standing before Pilate and Herod is yet a greater plummet. Who is Pilate that he should stand in judgment over the king of kings who is Herod that he should presume to stand in judgment over the king of kings who is Pilate to, to even think he can utter the words I find no guilt in this man who does he think he is his wife was given a dream Matthew tells us this. Matthew tells us that Pilate's wife couldn't sleep the night before except to be tormented by this dream that whatever her husband does the next day, do not declare the death penalty over this man. But we see, we see in the narrative, we see in the story, the weakness of Pilate. And Herod, Herod's in the city this day because it's Passover. We know why Herod's there. 
And Pilate has, has, has these accusations and these, and these statements thrown at him of Jesus' guilt, but he can't find anything wrong with him. So Pilate sends him to Herod thinking, well, he's a Galilean. He, 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 he certainly could be judged by Herod. He's under his jurisdiction. And Herod had been wanting to meet Jesus for a very long time. It was told earlier in the story as Herod was looking for Jesus to have an interview with him, to, to meet with him and to see a sign, to, to see a trick. You remember Jesus' reply? He says, go tell that fox that today and tomorrow I make cures and heal diseases. On the third day I will be perfected. He gives this cryptic and, and, and extremely, extremely vague and, 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 and strange prophecy that is to be returned to Herod that on these days I minister, but on the final day I will be risen in glory. Here's Herod's chance. Jesus comes and stands before Herod and we, we see what Herod does. He tries to get Jesus to perform a trick, a, a sign, a miracle. It, it is nothing more to Herod but a, but a party, a show. That's all it is for Herod. And after finding out that he can't get Jesus to speak, he can't get him to perform a miracle, he begins to mock him. They dress him in a, in a royal gown and they take sticks, long staves, bows, and they begin smacking him across the head and hurling insults and mockery at Jesus Christ. And then the crowd cries out, Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. At an incredibly strange twist of irony, at each, each Passover, Pilate had a, had a practice to appease the Jews. There is, there is no further demotion than ruling in Judea for a Roman consul, for a Roman ruler. And Pilate's main concern is making sure there are not any widespread riots or dissensions among the people. And so each Passover, he decides to release a prisoner to appease them, to make them happy. I'll release back to you one of your own. And he says to them, I'll, I'll, I'll give you your king. I'll give you Jesus. I'll give you the one who is called the king of the Jews. And the crowd screams and cries, we want Barabbas. Give us the murderer. Give us the one who is a danger to us and our children. Release him back into our society and crucify the Lord of life. Give us Barabbas. It's an incredible moment. As we see now at these final moments of Jesus' life, he will be flogged, beaten, tortured, and then driven to Golgotha to bear his reproach for our sin. Each subsequent step of humiliation, infinitely greater than the previous step, an infinitely gut-wrenching, stomach-turning, mind-blowing in agony He takes for you and me. He will go to the cross and Barabbas will be released. The criminal will be released and Jesus will be crucified. There is, there is clearly one of these two people who's going to die that day and Pilate wants to release the king. The people demand the murderer. In a very real sense, you and I, we are Barabbas. In a very real sense, you and I, we are the criminal. We are the one deserving of death. If you contrast Jesus with Barabbas, it's obvious which one deserves to die. You and I, we deserve to die. Our sins, our crimes, our rebellion, not against an empire, not against an earthly power, but our crimes against an infinitely holy God. The Bible is clear. Every sin committed will have its due recompense of reward. The Bible is clear, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory standard, and the penalty for sin is death. We are Barabbas. We deserve death. You might, you might be offended at that. Well, I don't, I'm not, come on, Craig. In this story, do I, I have to be Barabbas? Yeah, you're not Jesus. You're not the hero. You're the criminal. If you, if, if you continually listen to preaching and Bible teaching that exaggerates you as the hero, you need to stop listening to it. 
We're Barabbas. We're the criminal. We are the ones who've committed crimes against a just and holy God. And yet Jesus goes to the cross to pay for our sins so that we can be released of our burden to die for our own crimes. We're Barabbas. Every step of the story is incredible. The, the illegality, the, the immorality, the despicableness of this justice. But each of us in our heart needs to rejoice that it played out like this. What would we do if there was no Jesus, if there was no sacrifice, if there was no crucifixion, if there was no forgiveness, what would we do? Each and every one of us would stand before a just and holy God and He would call upon us to give an account for every sin we've ever committed. Every lie, every deception, every lust, every greed, every dishonoring or disparaging of God's name and His reputation. How would we reply? What kind of response could we conjure up? Every sin, every crime deserves an infinite penalty committed against the infinite justice of a holy God. Every crime, every penalty deserves eternity in hell. And yet here is your Jesus Christ. Innocent as confirmed by the wicked rulers of the world. But He will go to the cross to die for our Sins in our place, in our stead, so that we may be released. We need Jesus Christ. We need the story to play out like this. There's a sense of disgust in reading this. There's a sense of disgust in imagining the impeccable, holy, infinitely glorious God, now so humiliated that He stands before Pilate and Herod to be judged and mocked and ridiculed. There's disgust at that, but do not lose sight of the good news. If He does not tread this path, then you will. If he doesn't stand before Herod and Pilate and call to die, then you and I will stand before an infinitely greater magistrate, the sovereignty of God, and there we will be judged guilty. But of course, Jesus' death doesn't save everybody. The Bible is clear that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The death of Jesus Christ doesn't automatically save everybody, but only those who cry out to Him, who call upon His name and believe upon all that He is and all that He did for you and I as sinners. Will you trust in Jesus today? Will you believe in Jesus today? Will you remark how incredible this particular piece of narrative is and yet reflect upon the fact that you are Barabbas in prison, justly accused and condemned to death, but Jesus will die for you. Who is Pilate? Who is Herod? The greatest, the greatest judgment bar in the history of reality, is God's judgment seat. And that Jesus Christ was killed and crucified, you and I can be declared, we can be declared free. We thank God for the gospel. Let's pray, shall we? We thank you, Father, for the humiliation of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that in eternity past, it was decreed that Jesus Christ would come. The incarnate Son would empty Himself. Though He's in the form of God, fully and completely and eternally God, He will undergo a kenosis, an emptying, and take to Himself a human form, a human nature, he, Father, the Bible says, He will become like us so that He can suffer and die for us. We thank You, Father, that Jesus Christ didn't just become human, but He became a servant. He became obedient. He became a slave. And now we read, Father, in Luke 23, He, he became a criminal. He became a, a petty piece of flesh for, for the foolish kings to toss one to another. But He did that for us, Father, 
because of our sin, because of our fallenness, our brokenness. We are Barabbas. Maybe none of us have actually committed murder, Father, but yet Jesus has said, should we hate our brother without cause? Should we be angry? We've committed murder in our heart. We, we, all of us have broken your commandments, Father, and we need salvation. And the Bible is clear. This salvation is found only in Jesus Christ, who not only became one of us, but then on our behalf, he died for us and he suffered the torment and the wrath and the vengeance, God, that you feel against sin. And he died on our behalf. We thank you, Father, that because Jesus stood before Pilate and Herod as his judge, if we trust in him, we never need stand before you as our judge. For he is our redeemer. He is our savior. He is our justifier by his sacrifice and his resurrection. We thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ. I pray this morning, Lord God, for those right here in this, in this building right now, hearing my words, that their hearts would be stirred to believe. They would place their trust in Jesus Christ. They would no longer trust themselves or trust their pedigree or their education or their own good works or their own religiosity. They would abandon all that to place their trust exclusively in Jesus. And for those here today, Father, who've already done that, we've, we've already believed in Jesus. Our life is secure. Our sin's forgiven. I pray that we'd be stirred once again today by the good news, by the gospel, as we meditate upon the cost that Jesus Christ had to spend to save us from our sins. I thank you, Lord God, that we, in hearing and knowing and learning this, will be stirred toward greater obedience, toward greater conformity to Christ's likeness. And above all, Father, that we would seek to glorify you in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said, Amen.